idea was that the North Koreans would freeze their nuclear program, which is based there too. This will be the end of my technical discussion on what makes things go boom with nuclear weapons. Oh, come you, can on. Use, you can use plutonium or uh, enriched uranium. At the time, the North Koreans were clearly doing things involving plutonium. So the deal that was made was you stop doing that and we will get you two light water uh, uh, nuclear reactors so that you can use for power. Did we get an oven food aid too? Yeah, and, yeah, and, uh, and also fuel, also yeah. fuel, because the idea was, their claim was we need, our nuclear <laughs> program is not about weapons, it was, but it was also, we need power, okay? And um, when the Bush administration came to power, they were very skeptical of this whole deal. And in fact, there were follow-up talks, not about the weapons, but about uh, the construction of long-range missiles. Because that's the other thing. If you have nuclear weapons, How do you deliver it's, it's pretty easy to deliver them to your neighbor. right? You can use UPS or something like that. <laughs> but if you want to be able to deliver weapons at long range, you need long-range bombers, or possibly submarines with ballistic missiles, or just uh, 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 ICBMs. Okay? And so the, the idea was, of the Clinton administration, well, We'll get this deal about the plutonium plan, but we also want to negotiate about their plan to build missiles. The Bush administration stopped the missile talks. And then it was kind of like, well, what should we be doing? And it was a very serious matter and not an easy question to resolve. But the problem was it took them months to figure out what they wanted to do. Um, and in the meantime, one, North Korea got a little annoyed. And number two, it was more or less discovered that they also had a program to develop uh, uh, weapons using enriched uranium. And they more or less admitted to that. Um, the U.S. terminated its supply of fuel oil, and that was kind of the end of that whole deal. So if you are a skeptic about the Iran deal, you have every right to raise, well, we tried, it was a different kind of deal, but it was a deal with North Korea, and that didn't work, so what makes you think the right. Iran deal won't right. work? Right. We are currently, as of like right now, uh, exploring things with Pakistan. Obviously, Pakistan has nuclear weapons. They apparently are considering building tactical nuclear weapons, <coughs> which are smaller. And the U.S. concern is, the U.S. has fairly high levels of confidence that the the nuclear weapons that Pakistan currently has, they keep the weapons separate from the delivery system. They have pretty good security. FDA yeah. is actually in consultation with them, I think, yeah. on, on, on nuclear security. So, so, and we've helped them with nuclear security, as we have done with a lot of countries, including the then Soviet Union. Okay, Because the idea is, yeah, yeah. we may not like you, but we don't want someone else getting a hold of your nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons, because they're smaller, the concern is they would be easier for either a lower level commander or somebody else to get a hold of. So we know you, Pakistan, you have nuclear weapons, but we really, really don't want you to develop tactical nuclear weapons. Um, and could we maybe construct a deal based on you not doing that in return for things? But that's like in progress, like more or less as we speak. If I may say, so what you're saying is that the U.S. was the major player, the hegemon nowadays, since 1991. What it's trying to do is actually come up with deals that will, in your case, when we're talking, in our case, when we talk about Iran, turn down the heat. Mm -hmm. So we know that it's, things are on fire, okay? But they're not cooked yet, so what we're trying to do is lower the heat there. And in cases that when the food is ready in uh, North Korea, just spoil the dishes so you will not be able to serve it. So what we're trying to do is not actually stop something from going at the peak, but kind of you know, lowering the potential to arrive at the higher peak. That's kind of, you know, the essence that, of the deal so far. I admire you. That may be the longest culinary metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was Proustian in his elegance. The, the, you know, the basic problem Thank you, Chef. <laughs> is that once a state <laughs> reaches a certain level of economic development, they have the foundations of a nuclear program. Okay? Now, they still have to make the decision to go ahead with that program and have to commit the resources to it. But, you know, at the end of the day, 
there are probably right now about 40 countries that could build nuclear weapons. Every country in Western Europe could do it. Yes. Uh, absolutely. So now the Canada could become, do it. But then the question becomes, okay, so you're trying to convince, you're trying to cut the deal, right? Right. So we have a certain deal with Iran, and I appreciate it. So if you can give me a little bit how this comes down, or it kind of postpones everything to their generation of power, the 12 years down the road in terms of... I think of it as a geopolitical social security. But then, the, yeah, but then the other thing is, uh, what are the means that we're using, okay? Is it, are we using positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement? Well, we, it seems that what we're trying to do in all these cases is using positive reinforcement. Well, so we'll cut the, we'll cut down on the punishment or the sanctions or we'll give you or what works and why do we why do we believe that it will work? And okay, once with this, I have follow up to you, uh, Rick. Okay. In terms of why deals? Well, because why not kill them, fight them. <laughs> well, we have <laughs> placed a number of sanctions to, to get to Iran on Iran, and and I think there's no question that the impact, one of the main impacts of those sanctions has been to slow down their nuclear program. They can't, we can't stop it, we can slow it down. Uh, the problem is, with just using sanctions, is that again, it can't, if you have, we could sanction Fiji and be damn sure they could never develop nuclear weapons, right? But I don't think we're worried about Fiji. You know, if we take a country like Iran that's at that level of development, we cannot stop them with sanctions. We can slow them down, but the, in the long run, the only way to stop their program is to convince them they should stop their program. Now, that may be impossible to do, okay? Uh, but, you know, and people talk about a military strike and they always bring up the Israeli strike in 81, right? The problem with the Israeli strike in Iraq, the problem with that is it didn't stop Iraq's problem. If they, we destroyed, the Israelis destroyed a single facility, but not the whole program. And in fact, there's recent research that suggests that in reaction to that strike, Iraq actually started, uh, made that program a higher priority. So even there are, you can go on the internet and there are like 12 sites that are part of what we think of is the Iranian nuclear program. Yeah, Nantes, Fado, I mean, there's all. There's a nice little map here, you know, no problem. Uh, but if you think about striking them, there's a couple of there's a couple of issues. One, it's never going to be perfect. Okay, we have a, the world's most capable military, but things don't always work out perfectly. Number two, there may be other facilities. There there may be more than twelve facilities, but our intelligence agencies know about number thirteen through seventeen or something like that. So if there was a strike, they would get those as well. But there may be others that we don't know about at all. Okay? So you're not going to get all of it, and even if you did, they'll rebuild it. Now, that will lengthen, and possibly by a great number of years, the, the amount of time it would take them to build nuclear weapons. But as long as they have the motivation to do so, they can just keep coming back. This national intelligence estimate at sort of the end of the line, you know, as I said, they said they're not, Iran is not interested in actually building the weapons today. They just want to get up to that point. But it also said, unless there's a fundamental change in their government's priorities, they're going to keep after it. Okay? So, if sanctions, and then there's another thing about sanctions, if you, if you make them too extreme, you know, what we'd like to target are things directly related to the nuclear program and things directly related to the bad guys that are part of this program, right? But if you say, we cut off all your access to the international banking system, if you say you can't sell oil, that actually hurts a lot of Iranians who have nothing to do with these programs. So if you want to ramp up the sanctions, it seems to me the ones we have in place now, we sort of put in place the things that are most likely to hurt the nuclear program. If we ramp them up, we're going to start hurting more and more Iranians. Now, you could decide that considering the threat of Iran, that's an acceptable trade-off. That's up to you. But we know when we sanctioned Iraq after the 91 Gulf War, literally Iraqi children died because they couldn't import medicine. So how far down that road do you want to go? That's 
a decision yeah, that each of you make. One quick point, and it's to reinforce what Rick said about all these countries around the world and being able to develop a nuclear weapon. I mean, I think Japan could blink its eyes and have a nuclear weapon. Right? Here's what a physicist once told me. Remember, an atom bomb is 1945 technology. We built an atom bomb without a computer. We built an atom bomb with adding machines and pieces of paper and slide rules. So we're not talking about the most astonishingly complicated technology in the world here, right? Anyway, I just wanted to... Yeah, right. So actually, if you look after the 91 war against Iraq, you know, Iraq had signed the NPT. They clearly were cheating. After 91, because Iraq lost, we got to go in and inspect stuff. Okay, and in fact, two good friends of mine from graduate school were on, on some of those teams. And, and that was interesting because it, it showed you sort of the total picture of how the country that was violating the NPT, how were they doing it in the face of inspections, in the face, face of sanctions. So one of the little stories that suggests how countries do it is a, a bunch of inspectors went into this building that had been an industrial plant, and all the equipment had been moved out, you know. And so a bunch of the inspectors said, I have no idea what this facility is about. One of them had been a graduate student on the Manhattan Project, the U.S. bomb building project. And he said, I know exactly what this is. This was a facility that had calutrons. Now, again, not a physicist, not a bomb builder. Calutrons were, were something that the U.S. used to separate uh, uh, uranium. It turns out it's a very inefficient process. So at some point in time, the US said, well, we've got more efficient ways of doing this, so we're not going to use these things anymore. Iraq couldn't get access to quote unquote modern equipment to do it. So they said, well, hell, we'll just use calendars. It'll take longer. We're kind of Oak Ridge, if you have to yeah, yeah. Okay. So the point is that again, there's only so much that sanctions can do. Delay, yes. Stop a country once it's reached a certain level of development? No, it's not <coughs> possible. So, so if you do? really want to stop them, you've got to figure out another way to do it. Okay, so regime change. Yeah, okay, sure. That's what okay. we well in the past. Regime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they find the CIA. Yeah, we have some uh, examples in the. Well, we succeeded back in, in America. We succeeded in 53. Right? Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll be over yeah, here. One in one. Stop it. We want it, but we also, but right next, right next door, we failed in 2003. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're not very good with no. uh, our neighbor in the South here, huh? Uh, but uh, rather than talk, okay, regime change is an extreme way, but actually what Rick suggested, I wanted to, Joe, if you can comment on that, is changing the motivation. That was said, because the key thing is, you said technology is now available, Okay, technology is available, so the only thing that you need is money, and that's it, and then you get the bomb. So the question is, how do you change the motivation, eliminate it? Is it just well, a matter of changing the rulers, or changing the public perception, at least in countries that the public matters? Sure, bit. absolutely. And, you know, I'm not a theoretician of foreign policy like these gentlemen are, but there is something strange about nuclear weapons. It becomes, at one level, a badge. It's a badge that says, I'm an important country. I have arrived. I'm at the first tier of, of nation statehood. You saw this in the response to the nuclear detonations in Pakistan. There is something about the association with, it's, I think it's like the way people thought of dreadnoughts or, or battleships prior to World War I. In other words, the possession, the possession of dreadnoughts or big battleships was a signal that you had arrived. In fact, Germany wasted fortunes. In fact, it turns out a catastrophic strategic mistake in investing in these precisely. I think nuclear weapons possess that sort of aura in the world today. You know, who has nuclear weapons? United States, France, Germany, China, Russia. I mean, important countries. So I think there's, there's that weird sort of element there. I don't want to get rid of it. The, now, I think one of the key elements to answer your question is this. And here we move in an area where I don't think I'm an expert, but I, I've read a bit on. I think here, Iranian domestic dynamics may become critical. Right? Clearly, I don't, 
you just don't think of President Rouhani as a reformer. The reformers are not allowed to run in these elections, right? But he is a pragmatist, okay? He and his, his foreign minister, and I think a number of Iranians, foreign minister Zafari or Jafari, do you remember? Zafari. I think what they fundamentally want in terms of their external relations is for Iran to become a relatively normal country, right? That is to say, a country that is not diplomatically isolated, a country that has reasonable relations with other countries. Uh, now, I don't think that this is an ambition shared by the Supreme Leader and by most elements of the Revolutionary Guard and by other conservative elements within, within uh, Iran. But I do think that the pragmatists see the nuclear deal as a first step, right, toward removing some of these impediments to Iran becoming a more normal state, and therefore as a more normal state, not needing a nuclear weapon. I know it sounds circular, right? Uh, whether or not they'll succeed, I don't know. We'll have some sense of public opinion in February when elections occur in Iran. Okay? But something is occurring in Iran. Now look, the Supreme Leader and uh, went along with the nuclear deal, rather begrudgingly. And the Revolutionary Guard went along with it. They went along with it for one reason and one reason only, money. That's the only reason they went along with it. They're not, they don't care about non-proliferation. They're not interested in changing Iran's foreign policy. They're not interested in, in fact, they, they're terrified by the prospect of normalization of relations with the United States. It terrifies them. They want it for one reason, which is they get, Iran gets money out of the country. <coughs> it can be used in two ways. One of which is to, is to raise consumption levels within Iran, which builds political support. The three reasons. Another one can be to, to give basically payoffs to, to slivers of elites. You, if somebody said, you can bet that every captain and above in the Revolutionary Guards is going to have a new car by the end of next year, <laughs> when this is over with. And thirdly, in, in, in their foreign ex, in expenditures, in, 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 their, in their policies, in places like Iraq and Syria <clears throat> and elsewhere. Uh, but I think a lot of the, an the answer to your question, I think, depends in large part upon in in internal Iranian de political developments. So in that particular case, okay, so you talk about uh, what will happen next year to the cars of the uh, junior officers. When you're doing an international deal, mm -hmm. there is a concept, and Rick, and I'd like you to comment on that, as we're kind of, you know, closing, soon the closing of the part, global part, and then we'll have a Q&A from mm -hmm. the uh, audience here, is there is a concept in international relations, we'd like to talk about it, is the shadow of the future, mm -hmm. right? Because we know that one of the big issues in the bargaining in, in the interactions among nations is the fact that a certain commitment that is done nowadays will not hold forever and you're never sure about that. So one of the things is, okay, you, are, you choose an option because of two, let's say, different lenses. One set of lenses is, okay, how will it affect now? So if the option now for President Obama, okay, we will send boots to the ground, okay, or, uh, or missiles to the ground, mm -hmm. or we'll do a deal. And so we'll, and we hate boots on the ground because it's kind of, you know, it's not comfortable to the public. And uh, so we want to do a deal, and therefore, since the deal is the only option that we'll have, we will bargain with the best we can. And this is for the lens now. Twelve years in politics is ages because I think in terms, po politics are myopic. We think in terms of two-year cycles, four-year maximum if you're talking about re-election or something like that. So twelve years, okay, let's go. Well, uh, do we care about it? Can we anticipate what will happen? If you're saying that their motivation, their foreign policy motivation, at least of the segment, of the Iranians' uh, leadership is directed conventionally to what they do and what Rick defined uh, earlier is now speak. Only part of them want to be, to normalize their relationship right. with. So, 12 years from now, it's kind of, you know, was this part of the consideration? 
can we anticipate, or anyone in the people who organize this, the nations who organize, can anticipate that 12 years from now there will be normalization, that this faction will win? We, we can't know that. The, the, no. the, the, the question is, given the available options, <coughs> what, what do you, what's your best bet? It may be, you know, in terms of the probability, it's not very high. Your best bet is there will be some kind of change over the next 12 years in what their government's priorities are. We know there are moderates <coughs> that, that want yeah. to devote more effort to what's happening internally. We don't and know. I'm talking Oliver, not Oliver Thomas Jefferson, yeah, by the way. Yeah, right? yeah. We're not talking about... And yeah. so that a lot of times it may be like, I, I'm you know, not a believer in democracy, but I do believe unless I can raise the standard of living mm -hmm. for the people, they'll revolt. Right. And I want to stay in power. Right. So it's all selfish, but maybe... So we can't know that. But in some ways, the battle is between the idea that the moderates, quote unquote, will take most of the gains from this uh, uh, agreement and devote it to internal things and therefore be not messing around as much as externally versus those people that believe you're just going to pile a whole <coughs> load of money out there for the conservative elements in the government to spend bribing people, uh, buying stuff, giving resources to others. Sending people. rockets to his beloved. Right, right. You know. And so, in some ways, we haven't even talked about things which I think is appropriate. I, like, uh, uh, you know, how much uh, enriched uranium are they going to be able to keep, and what about how many centrifuges and the technical parts of that. And that's, that is important. But the deal and your position on it, I think, is really about what you think might happen in the future and what you think, you know, given the available options, even if the probability is not that great, is it still better to try this than to, to, I would, to ratchet up the sanctions or to try military action? I think that's what the real philosophical difference is. I would add people. one factor to this. In looking down 15 years hence, first of all, I mean, 15 years in the Middle East might as well be two goddamn millennia. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Oh, I wonder how many people got rich, you know, betting on the Arab Spring. Um, and how many people got rich betting on the Arab Spring once it started and on how it would end. Uh, look, 